Okay, so welcome to the third day of the conference. And um, I, we have a, Nate Cheplak talking this morning about regulimits limits and microstates. We've given him an extra, so a little bit of extra time because Joseph and I both asked him to try and explain a little bit more pedagogically about iconal approximations and all that sort of stuff. So over to you, Nate. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk. Um, so I'm going to hopefully give a very um, brief introduction, more conceptual issues with a lot of the uh, mathematical details hidden and to the regulimit and how these can be used in, uh, in terms of in the microstates program. Um, this is work which is done in, um, in collaboration with Stefano Giusto, Rodolfo Russo and his student Marcel Hughes at Queen Mary. And in a sense, these are going to be the generalization of this paper that these three authors have uh, had in July. And in, in cer certain senses, we're going to go beyond that and trying to go towards the black hole limit in, um, and in what sense this um, going to get, get uh, hopefully clear a lot as we go along the presentation. Oops. Okay. Okay. So just a brief outline. So first of all, I'll try to give a brief motivation of what we're going to, uh, why we're doing this, and then set up the problem in the ADS free um, uh, CFT2 frame. And then uh, the bulk, the majority of the time, we're going to spend talking about the Reggie limit and how this is going to be incorporated both in the bulk and on the CFT side, what this means, uh, and in principle, what, uh, what, what new information can we gather by taking this kinematical limit? And in section three, we're going to check that all of these results um, that are gonna be quite abstract in section two can be applied or can be checked with on the conical defect on one zero and superstrata to linear order. And then briefly, we're going to discuss how going towards the black hole regime in this discussion that we had in the previous days, where if you take this, um, this a parameter to zero, just probing deeper and deeper into the, uh, into the black hole regime. And then we're gonna finish with some, some further questions that we have along with this, uh, this method. So just to start, just to start off, I think uh, one of the, alongside our microstates program that we had, that um, we've been discussing in the pre previous few days, in the last few years, there's been quite a lot of new results new, very nice information that we've gathered just in general about CFTs, uh, especially about their consistency conditions, what need to be, what needs to be, um, what needs to hold if wants to have, wants, one wants to have a CFT, which has a gravitational dual. And in fact, I think there's a lot of things that we can learn about um, microstate by just using these CFT techniques. And for example, for me, there's kind of like at least three ways in which we can use this. Um, the first of all is we have a lot of existing microstates, a lot of existing uh, smooth geometries that we know um, and love, and can the CFT techniques tell us new information about them? So in particular, for example, can the CFT distinguish between uh, um, an ensemble of pure states and between a pure state? So what, what's the difference between those? Can the CFT distinguish between them? And for example, can the CFT see a horizon? That would be, for example, one of, the, one of the interesting things to do. The second way is probably what has been discussed at the end of David's talk is, can we use CFT results to predict new pathways to construct supergravity uh, constructions, just to create new microstates? And the third one is uh, kind of on the contrary, can these microstates that have already been constructed give us new information about the underlying CFT? Um, all of these issues are, of course, of course, quite complicated, quite difficult. So using particular regimes, one can perhaps learn some simplified data just as a starting point. And in fact, the regulimit, we will see that the regulimit is sort of a kinematical regime in which some of the information that we can, uh, that are both uh, found on the bulk side and on the CFD side get simplified. And in fact, one of the nice things that we're going to see is there is a nice, um, nice relation between the bulk phase shift, which is a purely geometrical, um, geometrical objects and the CFD data, which are the anomalous dimension and three point couplings. Um, and there is a very nice one-to-one -one correlation between those two. And then we're gonna check whether these uh, um, results actually are valid for microstates and the conical defect. So just to set up the problem. So this is what we've been discussing in the last two days. We're gonna be working on uh, just a 10-dimensional manifold, which has an internal T4, 
is for concreteness, we're going to have a large S1, which has a radius Ry, and it's parameterized by the coordinate Y, and then a flat space, four-dimensional flat space in the time direction. And then in, in this kind of space, we're going to throw in a bunch of D1 and D5 brains in a particular configuration um, so that they wrap around the compact dimensions and add some left moving momentum. And as you turn on the gravitational coupling, you will see that either if you take a uh, take an ensemble, you get a black hole. But if you take a really coherent, nice coherent superposition, one would get something which has a smooth cap. And in fact, we'll be interested only in one region. So these states are usually asymptotically flat, but we will cap off here in the ADS region. So we will take the near horizon region, which is asymptotically ADS3 cross S3. And one of the important things is, as we've also this talk from, for example, from Matthias's talk, is that there exists a dual two-dimensional CFT called the D1D5 D CFT with a large central charge in which the dynamics should be equivalently described. And just as a reminder, so these um, quantized uh, numbers of D1D5 brains are related to supergravity charges in this way. And just to make sure, throughout this talk, I'm going to be working in the large N or equivalently in the large central charge regime, but I'll be specifically at the supergravity point. So I'll be working where at the point where the CFT is strongly coupled. Now, the central dynamical object in the CFT that will be um, of interest is the four-point correlation function, which I'll be dubbing HHLL. Uh, and this is because what we're going to have is two operators which are light, which means that their conformal dimension does not scale with the central charge. And I'm going to have two operators which are generically heavy, which means that their conformal dimension scales with the central charge. And in fact, the ratio uh, between their conformal dimension and the central charge will be fixed and will be used as um, will be fixed as the conformal uh, as the central charge increases. And this parameter mu, which on the gravity side is uh, related to the mass of the black hole or a heavy object that we put inside, will be used as an uh, as an expansion parameter in our analysis. Um, so the heavy states, heavy operators, can be um, will usually be our super strata states that we're going to uh, calculate. And for a series of papers by Bombini, Galliani, Giusto, Moscato, and Russo, they showed that these two holographic two-point functions in the setup that we're going to consider can be actually obtained by considering a two-point function in the geometry, which is deformed by these heavy states, um, by solving the equations of motion, imposing regularity at the interior, and then what we're going to have, the boundary, boundary value, um, gives us the correlator. Um, and an important point, which perhaps ties to what David has been saying, so four-point functions are not protected by supersymmetry, which means that in general, the results that we're going to obtain at the free orbifold point are generically different from what we're going to obtain from, for example, this holographic calculations that we obtain at the supergravity point. Um, the next ingredient that we're going to uh, use is we're going to expand this correlator in uh, different channels. And in fact, the two channels that are going to be important for us are the direct channel in which, which would be normally I think in scattering called the T channel in which the two light operators are brought together and the two heavy operators. And then some, um, some operators are exchanged in this channel and also the cross channel uh, where H and L are brought together. So the operators here are generically um, heavy operators which are exchanged. So composite operators made out of this, and we'll be focusing on a cross channel here. Um, perhaps in a more mathematical sense, what, what we can do is one can write these expansions in terms of products of three point couplings, which are just uh, at this point, and we sum over quasi primary states, and, uh, and their contributions are summarized in this uh, conformal blocks, which for our case are just going to be um, uh, hypergeometric functions. Uh, of um, the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic um, um, functions, and just as a um, just as a quick comment, I've already chosen a particular gauge so that the correlator, which uh, would depend generically on um, the insertion points, depends only on um, on the particular values of the cross ratios. And what I want to tell you, because I, uh, as I told you, this, um, as we go from the free orbital point to the supergravity point, some of the operators, which are not protected, um, uh, obtain some, um, gain some anomalous dimensions. 
especially if we look at the cross channel where a heavy and a light operator are fused together, what we find is that these operators that are exchanged are double trace operators where a heavy and a light, um, light particle are, are fused together and then dressed with a lot of derivatives or derivatives of how many you want. And these operators have a conformal dimension. We know what the conformal dimensions are. So they're just the sum of the conformal dimensions of the constituent particles plus the number of derivatives at the act and then a, an anomalous dimension gamma m, which we denote with gamma m. And these are generically, you can think of them as binding energies between different uh, particles that are fused together. And they are typically negative. Um, and these get corrections. And we're going to expand them in our analysis. It's quite important that these can be expanded in terms of this um, mu, which is the ratio between the, con uh, the conformal dimension of the heavy state and the central charge. Similarly, the same can be said about the couplings which we're going to generically denote with this kind of uh, with this expression, but we are not going to be focusing on them too much, but just know that um, I will be focusing on the anomalous dimensions, but almost entirely, uh, almost the entire um, same thing can be said about the couplings. Um, the takeaway of this is if I expand this expression in terms of mu, just and work order by order in this expansion between this, um, the, the uh, conformal dimension and the central charge, what you will find that generically these uh, corrections are heavily um, entangled, entangled in a way that it's difficult to get the um, dif uh, different contributions uh, from any form of, if we have a specific correlator. So what is usually a nice um, way of disentangling those is by taking a specific limit and specific kinematic limit in which we hope that certain operators will dominate and will be able to uh, obtain their, um, their contributions directly. In, um, but in, in that kind of way, we're going to lose some information along the way. So, and this is precisely what the Reggie limit is. So the Reggie limit is a kinematical regime where some of these contributions will disentangle and we'll be able to determine them very nicely in a particular limit. So just to, um, just to motivate this perhaps from a familiar picture, if we consider just a standard uh, two to two scattering in flat space and just think about a generic expansion in terms of Feynman diagrams, in terms of coupling, you would write some kind of these diagrams. And then in these dots, you would have a lot of loops, all the different channels, whatever is allowed. Um, and if you wanted to have like a full amplitude in, gen gen um, in, in general, you would have to sum over all of these different diagrams. But then if you go to a specific kinematic re uh, limit or specific, specific kinematic region, you would find that only a subset of these diagrams contribute and only a subset of them are important for actually uh, for, for that limit. And especially the Reggie limit is the limit where we have highly energetic scattering where low momentum is exchanged between the particles or equivalently small angle scattering. We find that really it's only a subset of those diagrams which are important. And those are the diagrams which are given by those um, infinite sum of the ladder diagrams where um, it's just a T channel with a lot of uh, interaction in between. And in fact, not only that, but we also find that if we increase the center of mass energy, we find that only the, the exchange um, particle, which, is, uh, which has the highest spin dominates. And for usual theories with, uh, with gravity, this is just a graviton. And furthermore, finally, with going to this iconal, uh, iconal approximation, one finds that if we calculate all of these contributions um, all, and sum them all together, instead of having a lot of different term by terms which uh, deviate, they actually sum up to something nice and just give us a phase. And this phase contains the information about all of these scattering uh, processes come together. So this is very, I know that this is very, very simplified, but this is the main physical intuition that I have behind the scattering, uh, behind the Reggie limit that we're going to discuss now. Um, we've talked in the previous slide, I've talked only about flat space scattering, uh, but in fact, the scattering to ADS has been uh, generalized um, about 14, 15 years ago by Cornalba, Costa, Penedonis, Schiappa um, in a series of papers. But for our purposes, when we're going to um, have a heavy object in the middle, we're going to consider a different kind of scattering, which is, I mean, a, a cousin, let me, let me say it like that, and in which case we have a heavy, uh, highly energetic particle which is scattered in an asymptotically ADS geometry, 
which is generated by this heavy operator. And this kind of limit was considered, I think, first by uh, the group in uh, Dublin, by Carlson, Kulasigi, and Parnachev and Tadic. Um, and what they, so what this um, associated with, uh, is associated with in the bulk picture is because we have a highly energetic particle, we can approximate the path that it's going to take as it travels through the ADS by an, uh, approximately by a null geodesic. And if you think about just a pure ADS picture, what will happen is all of the geodesics that start at one point will all converge to the other, to the, uh, to the other point. They will all have the same phase shift. But as soon as I put in the middle, I put a heavy object, something like a black hole or a microstate, it will cause the, um, it would cause the null geodesics to kind of uh, go apart. And what we will expect is something of a time delay. So we, we can time delay in a, in a shift. So the different null geodesics will, end, uh, will come out of the bulk at a different point. Uh, we'll, enter the, uh, we'll get back to the boundary at a different point. So let us be a, a little bit more specific in, uh, about this. Let's consider a null geodesic which follows this path. That path let's let R0 be the closest point or the turning point where it goes back to the boundary and let delta y and similarly delta t be the differences between the points where um, where the null gd6 will come out in the pure ads uh, case and where it would come out if we have a heavy object in the middle um, we will focus only a subset of geometries um, which have two conserved quantities so we'll have something which um, a conserved uh, energy, and we also have a conserved angular momentum. And in those kind of uh, geom uh, geometries, we can define a phase shift. So we will define a phase shift, which will be a central key player in our analysis, which is just a product of the energy and a time shift. And uh, we, we add, in addition, um, the angular momentum and the, the, the angular deviation from what we would have before. So the PT and PY would be the same for the, geom uh, for the ADS and the deformed geometry case, but the delta T and delta Y will contain non-trivial information about the metric. And in fact, for a particular kind of metrics, which we will take a block, uh, a block dimensional, uh, sorry, block diagonal. So we have just GYY, GTY, and so on and so forth. Just G GRR is the only uh, term in the radial direction. We find that we can uh, calculate this bulk phase shift by just this simple expression here. May uh, I ask a question? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, why do you put uh, minus PY delta Y? It's a space coordinates. Usually you put a plus. Um, yeah, so I think, I think it's all dependent on how you define them, right? So um, um, I think in this case, the PT is also negative. With that, so... No, no, but I mean, with a minus sign, the T is okay. I mean, uh... This is what you usually define as the energy. It's a minus the derivative of the action with respect to time. Yeah. But the spatial momenta are usually the plus derivative. Uh, okay. Maybe it's, uh, it's irrelevant, but... Uh, I, I think the difference is, so it depends on whether you have... So I, you have to be careful with this minus signs. I agree, that's definitely true. But I think, I think it's the difference whether you have the upstairs or downstairs uh, index. Ah, okay, maybe you're right. Okay. So I, I, th I think that that's, uh, I always get caught up on this, but, uh, as, uh, but I agree up to minus signs, this is the expression. <laughs> um, I mean, if the, if, if the P's have downstairs indices, that's the Lorentz invariant quantity. So if they have upstairs indices, it's not Lorentz invariant, so. No, no if I, uh, uh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Um, cool. Um, I hope this was, uh, in any, any case, um, the upshot of this, uh, this is you have to be careful about the minus signs as well. I, I agree. This is definitely one of the key points as well. Um, do you, do the, you have to get, to get to this expression you've written down here, I assume you have to assume the metrics time independent and Y independent, or is this? Yeah, I think so. I think this, this ties into together that you have two conserved quantities, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, yeah. So the, the so this is one of the constraining factors here. You have to assume that you have a specifically nice metric, which in this case, I think that depends only on the radial coordinate. Yeah, okay. um, but you, can you do this for things that don't have a, a well, you know, single mode superstrata satisfy this condition, but multi-mode superstrata do not. They depend on V. Yeah. Um, 
it's also the the next thing is also like you have to so i think this is just done currently for the simplest geometries we have just a stationary and independent of the of the angular point um what would happen i don't know what would happen if you only have a one conserved charge um then obviously you can't define anything that is conserved along the geodesic in that kind of way um but, but certainly but I wonder whether that's some kind of invariant which goes in the U direction or the V direction or something like that. Are you really using the fact you've got that combination PT delta T plus PY delta Y? Could that just be written as PV delta V or something stupid like that? And then you're, you're away. No, probably not. You know, I mean, the superstrata come with a with a with a null killing vector. So yeah. PU delta U would be something that would, for BPS things would be universally a conserved quantity. And I'm wondering whether you over demanding the symmetry to get this to work. I think you can write this expression as P mu x dx mu integral. In the case in which P mu is not conserved, you will have a non-trivial integral, and therefore you can compute the. Uh, ah, okay. But P u delta mu, for at least for BPS, is is precisely the thing that is conserved. But the individually, P t and P y are not. In general, no. Yes, in general, I would expect that you will have a P mu dx mu integral, and then in this case, in the case it's conserved, you get this expression, this simple expression. Otherwise, you will have, depending on the geometry you have, you will have a non-trivial P y. And you should integrate it over there. Right. Okay. No, that's good. Mm, yeah. 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 That's that's probably. Thank you. I I think I think you can definitely find something that's conserved along the uh, along a conserved quantity. Just how you, if, if it has this uh, nice expression, I, but, uh, this nice expression is dependent on the fact that we have a really nice geometry that we're dealing with. Um, Okay, the last thing that I want to say is this is just an um, impact parameter that we have. Um, and it measures how, it will measure basically how deep we go into, into uh, close to the center we're going to go. So this was all from a bulk perspective point of view. What, what does this imply on the CFT side? And in fact, um, you, when you do all of the calculation, all of, the, um, all of how, to perf uh, how to precisely place the points on the boundary, so that they're um, they are related by a certain uh, distance, you find that the prescription on the CFT side is in fact that you have to analytically continue Z component clockwise around the um, around the origin in the uh, in the um, in the um, uh, convention that we're taking now uh, that we're taking in this uh, paper. And then what you have to do is along after you analytically continue, you have to take the limit where Z and Z bar go to equal to one. And what this does, once uh, you can analyze the channel, this, uh, channel uh, the compositions in this limit, and one finds that the indirect channel, only the exchanges with the highest spin dominate. So this would be a direct uh, an um, analogy of what we have in the flat space case. But what we might be interested in as well, in this cross channel where we have these composites of heavy and light operators, you find that only the exchanges with heavy M, uh, with large M and M bar dominate. So these would be the operators which we had here, which would be dressed with very large number of derivatives or basically operators which have a higher number, uh, uh, very high conformal dimensions. And this also, but not only this, you also find that there is a considerable simp simplification of how you can write the uh, with uh, how you can write the uh, analytically continued correlator, and this was one of the nice result of uh, Kulak, uh, Kulak Ang and Parnacho, is they found that the bulk phase shift. So in a part in the particular limit where both PT and PY is greater than uh, is much greater than one. Um, also, just uh, uh, I have ignored the radius of ADS for now. Um, you can write the correlator as a, uh, you can write the Fourier transform of the correlator in the Reggie limit. And you find that you can write it in a certain kind of way, which will be important for our, um, for our purposes. And not only that, you can write it in terms of some, uh, some partial wave decomposition, but you can include all of these different, all of these um, interaction terms in a phase as well. And most importantly, the phase shift that you define in this kind of way is precisely given by the phase shift that you find from the bulk point of view. 
Um, this is also subject to some identification that you're going to find here. And just to give you back an in intuition that we had in the flat space, if I see what this, um, this, uh, what this factor here is, you find that um, if you compare it with the full decomposition in the cross channel, these terms all are just basically um, the free field, um, free field versions of them. So this terms is e M and M um, is just this term as if you had no black hole in, in there. And then every single interaction, all of the all of the interactions or all of the interaction that you get from just by placing a heavy object into your into your system exponentiate into this nice phase shift, which can be in this particular limit given by just a geometrical object that you find in the bulk from this phase shift. And furthermore, one of the nice things that you can find about this is when we talked about the bulk, we never considered anything what the light probe was. So we never considered the details of the light probe. We just said, because the light probe is so heavily, uh, is, uh, has such a high energy, it doesn't really depend on whether it's, whether it's a, a dual to fermion field or, 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 um, or a bosonic field. And it implies a certain kind of universality of the Regi limit also for the correlator as well. And we will, you can specifically check that this is the case, that you, once you do the Regi limit, the correlators will, apart from these free, uh, these contributions, which contain the, uh, the value of the light uh, correlator, this is the only where it comes in, everything else is completely determined, is completely universal just from this Regi analysis. And finally, one of the nicer things that you can find this, you can also expand the bulk phase shift in terms of this parameter mu, which is just the parameter, which in the bulk you can interpret as the ratio, as the, um, the mass of the black hole or how much you deform the, the geometry from ADS to um, really a really um, black hole geometry. Um, you can expand this and you can compare this with the anomalous dimensions of, um, of the dual C of this composite operator. And you actually find that if you go, uh, if you perform this analysis term by term, you find very nice data where on, on the left-hand side, you have something which is purely uh, CFT data. And on the right-hand side, you have something which is uniquely expressed just in terms of the bulk data. And finally going down this ladder further and further down, you find that there is a very nice uh, partial resumpt formula where this uh, expansion over the mass of the black hole or over the uh, central charge, uh, sorry, of the uh, conformal dimension over the central charge is completely um, uh, irrelevant. So as long as you can expand these forms into here, this formula will hold. And perhaps our goal is that when you have this expression which doesn't really depend on the small values of mu, you can perhaps probe the black hole limit where this mu or the conformal dimension will actually be large. Uh, and I didn't, don't give the explicit expression here, but just so you know that the same expression can also be found explicitly for the three point couplings. Okay, so this was really the completely generic, um, generic abstract theory. So now let's check this in the terms of microstates. Um, and uh, just as a warm up exercise, we're going to do the conical defect, uh, which is given by this kind of, um, this kind of metric, a very simple metric. Uh, we have the usual relation Q1 and Q5, but what we're going to do to just have this, we, ha we want to have the small mu expansion. What we're going to do, we're going to conti analytically continue this K value to have any real value, not just integers. And then furthermore, we're gonna parameterize one over K uh, with this uh, coefficient one minus mu to have a nice um, mu, um, to, uh, to have a nice uh, relation between the CFT and the bulk. And in fact, mu will now take values between zero and one. And in this case, the bulk uh, has a very nice, uh, the geometry is very nice. And what you can find is that the bulk phase shift is given by this expression here, which is uh, completely, um, which is exact and mu. Or if you put in the identification that we talked about here, what you can find is you can find this phase shift purely in terms of M and M bar and this geometry is sufficiently simple that the factor which contains all the information about the CFT and all the information about how, how much you deform the geometry is, um, is uh, are factorized. So they don't interfere with each other. 
And so if you just want to ask, like, why did, why did we consider the conical defect and not the BTZ black hole? One of the assumptions that we have in this calculation is that the, con that the null geodesic comes back out to the boundary. Uh, and this is the case for a conical defect, which has mu, is, mu in less than one. However, for the black hole, if mu is greater than one, which is the regime for the black hole, um, which you can find by just putting this back into the equation, you find that all of the um, all of the null geodesics fall back in. And you can see perhaps the the simplest way uh, to see this is if you take if you take mu goes to one in this phase shift, you will see that it falls first. It will diverge. Uh, and then secondly, it will be also become uh, imaginary or it become complex, which is another interesting uh, thing in itself. Um, the thing that we're going to compare it to is the correlator, which was found exactly um, in a, a paper by uh, these authors. And in this case, we're gonna take a chiral primary, which is just, um, um, which has conformal dimension one half and one half. Now, the important thing is uh, here, perhaps the checks are first of all, to see whether these um, results are, um, are fine, whether the general theory is okay, but also because we continually, we analytically continue to K to have real values uh, and not just integers. The theory tells us that for non-integer K, this could have an interpretation as ter in terms of an ensemble of states. So one might wonder whether you can use the regulament to see whether there are any inconsistencies in the constraints. So if you do any bootstrap equations, would you find that the results are inconsistent with each other? So there is like something which is missing or, um, or by taking K is non-integer uh, non that you find some, something that's wrong. Uh, unfortunately, um, Justo Hughes and Russo uh, worked the linear order and found everything is okay. Uh, and working at higher orders, we also found Generalizing this to higher orders in mu, when you do the mu expansion, you also find that this is um, the results are absolutely fine. So there are no inconsistencies. And you can, there is, um, at least we couldn't tell whether this is an ensemble or a pure state. Uh, finally, one of the things that you can do explicitly in this case is you can find the um, uh, anomalous dimension ex uh, exactly in this case. And if, if you compare it to mu, you find that both. If you compare these re relations in uh, these relations that we found here, that for the conical defect, both order by order, all the equations are um, okay. And then the, uh, the expressions are actually sufficiently simple that you can also show that this exact formula is true um, for all values of mu. Okay, now let's go to something which, uh, which is, has been discussed a little bit more in this conference is let's focus on one zero and superstrata. Um, so these are the heavy states, um, which we're going to be considered are co uh, coherent superpositions of just these plus, plus plus strands, which are just a vacuum. And then we have a bunch of zero zero strands, which are dressed with momentum carrying ex um, with operators, which give them momentum. Um, on the gravity side, we have these, uh, so we have this factor of NA and NB, which are related on the gravity to this uh, continuous parameters n uh, a and b and we have these two constraints that need to be satisfied by by the cft state and by the uh, geometry respectively and in this case the, um, there is a, a slightly more complicated relation between b over a and mu but nonetheless you can uh, work this out um, so there is a specific um, when we did the analysis there's a specific kind of um, metric that we were uh, we were using, and in fact, um, the one zero n is sufficiently simple that you can find a metric which um, conforms to that. So the ADS three part conforms to that standard. Uh, so uh, satisfy those assumptions, um, and you can find that it's relatively simple, a factor apart from these bump functions here. Um, so. The problem here is if you do the four point correlation functions, they're quite difficult to analyze. So if you want an analytic, um, analytic uh, function, these are known only to linear order than B squared over A squared. Um, and in fact, these correlators are given by complicated function of polylogarithm functions or dilogarithm functions uh, packaged into these D hat functions. The details of them will not be important. The only thing that's important here is if you check all the results, um, 
you will find that they're all consistent. So there is no inconsistency we found. So we check them, results are okay. Um, and just for, as a check to see how much um, that these results are slightly more um, uh, complicated than that for the conical defect, you see that for, for example, when n is equal to one, um, you get these kind of expressions and they're all uh, very much uh, consistent with each other. Finally, the most important thing for our uh, for our program is if you go to leading order in b squared over b squared over a zero squared, this amounts to just a small deformation of empty ADS. Our analysis would be like let, would we would prefer to have something which is exact in b or really where we'd have a large value of b because this would amount to um, uh, finite deformation of ADS. So one of the goals uh, of this uh, whole method that we're trying to use is that if you have the linear result, can you somehow generate the high order correlator? Either high order correlator, or can you tell something about the geometry even at higher orders by knowing what the linear result is? So um, the, the question is, now that we've done these checks to linear order, can we perform them for a higher order? And perhaps one of the nicer geometries that might help us in this case is the one zero zero two charge geometry, which is just part of the um, Ramon Ramon uh, ground states, which has been discussed yesterday, I think, in the, uh, the conversation where we have just plus plus one strands and zero zero one strands. And this one is a nice exception because for that uh, correlator, we know, uh, so for that geometry, we know the correlator exactly in B is in terms of a two uh, complicated two sum, but nonetheless, you know the correlator exactly in B. And if you ask me, well, so what is the correlator to power B to the power of 58? Uh, with enough uh, Mathematica and enough coffee, you can give, I can give you this in terms of polylog 116, whatever. Um, but the most important thing is also for this one, this geometry is simple enough that you already know the binding energies. So you can see that, can I uh, compare the results, which also from the bulk point of view, the phase is simple enough the binding energies, which are effectively the anomalous dimensions are also safe enough so we can check them. Will this method actually work for higher and higher mass? Because one of the questions that you might have is if I increase the mass to a critical point of view, to, to a critical value that the mass is so large that I cannot trust this approximation uh, well enough, will this just break down? And so far we've checked to a really to a higher order and we found no, um, no problems at all. So, now going to the final part, how far can we trust these results, right? So um, the nice thing about this is if you look at this phase shift, taking the limit where the road will become infinitely long and we start to approximate the BTZ black hole better and better, we will take the limit A over A zero goes to zero, which actually corresponds to B squared over two A zero, uh, B squared going to two A zero squared from the constraint that we saw before a few slides ago. But in this case, you see that the bulk phase shift will, um, will, just, um, will just diverge. It will become very, very large. Um, on the other hand, if you take the binding en energies, the binding energies can remain, even if you take the limit when A goes to zero, they remain finite, they remain okay. And that this is not just something you can see also for um, just for a microstate, even for the conical defect. This is one of the um, one of the um, one of the properties that you see from this expression, where if you take mu is equal to one, you get this divergence. Whereas here, if you take mu is equal to one, you still get um, you still get a, a square root fall off, but the this kind of uh, the anomalous dimension will stay finite. Um, so yeah, so this is where we are at the moment. So now the next step is, so we perform other checks. We know that we can, we can rely on this result. So what can we do next? Um, and before we, I continue, just give me, let, let me give a brief summary of what we've discussed so far. So we've introduced the Regi limit, um, most importantly for the fixed target scattering in ADS uh, based on the results of the Dublin group. We saw the relation between the bulk phase shift, which is a purely geometric data, and the CFT data in, um, in the three-point coupling and the anomalous dimensions. And then we analyzed the general, um, general um, um, construction by using the conical defect geometry and found no inconsistency, even though we generically expect the conical defect to be given by an ensemble of CFT states. 
And then we also analyzed the one zero n superstrata um, to whatever degree was possible and found no inconsistencies whatsoever. So once this is done, so the checks are now done. So let's try to speculate, try to see what's next. Um, so first of all, we have some questions which are based on the method. So how far can we trust the approximation? Uh, one of the key things that we considered is that on the bulk side, we have this highly energetic particle, which follows a null, ge uh, null geodesic. Um, so I think Nick and, um, Nick and Yosef and Emil will have some questions. How far can we trust these null geodesics? Um, um, and the question perhaps is given what we've seen from Emil's talk yesterday is, can we go beyond supergravity? So can we in in include stringy probes, um, which would be interesting from what uh, Nick and Emil have discovered um, in their recent paper. And furthermore, from a more really more technical point of view, can this be generalized to more uh, generic space time which don't, which don't have this um, to um, conserved quantities. Um, and from a physics point of view, the most important information that we have, can this method give us some new information about the black hole microstate? So taking A is equal to zero, can we learn something about from this, just from studying this limit? Um, furthermore, like one of the main questions would be, is it possible to distinguish pure states from ensembles? First of all, in the stretch limit or more generally in the CFT. So this would be a nice starting point from that. Um, and just uh, as, as I talked before, can I study the black hole limit using this um, method? And finally, um, there was a nice comment in the latest paper by Parnachev where they talked about a regime where um, the, there is a transition between the null geodesics which go out and then there's a region where the null geodesics are captured. So I think, I think also Massimo will talk a, a little bit about this in his talk, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but it would be interesting to see if there's so, some kind of transition also here in ADS. Um, and finally, one, one of the interesting things I also think is that you, so we know that um, a bulk, a conical defect doesn't, um, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't capture any null GD6, whereas the BTZ hole captures all of them. So in a sense, the microstate would be interpolating between those two regimes. So is there a way, is there at some point where we would see any capture? Just perhaps even from a super point, super gravity point of view, or from a string point of view, um, and I think that's it. Uh, I think I will end, end here. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you. Um, that was a nice talk. Um, so, questions from? I have one simple-minded question. I mean, you said that uh, you're talking about some kind of sort of sphere in which which is the boundary sphere where things are captured in ads3 everything just goes in so how would you implement anything like that in, in... so so that is yeah so that is the question but everything goes in in ads3 right but for yeah. our microstate we found that you know so when you say everything goes in in ads3 you mean well like btz yeah. yeah there's no there's no but there's a photon sphere right it's, yeah, it's, so, it's, so. that's the scale b right when you start skimming the scale b you dive down an ADS2 throat. Right. But if you're outside, if the point of closest approach is, is, is larger than of order B, right. then I okay. think you just stay outside. Oh, good. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, please go ahead. Sorry? Go ahead, please. Uh, could you flash again the, the previous uh, transparency, uh, let's say the one with delta, the, the formula for delta in terms of beta? Uh, yes, this formula. Uh, what, uh, what about the limit in which delta is equal to zero? You so the delta is equal to zero would be just the, so that would be the limit where we're basically ADS, right? So I, I think that would be the, the limit where uh, if delta is equal to zero, delta is always measured with respect to ADS. So that would be just the particle which is traveling almost on the boundary. So... <laughs> Beta equal to one, no? This is the limit. Uh, beta goes to one in this. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the limit where the, at least I understand it as the limit where the angular momentum is much larger. Uh, so yeah, uh, so where the null geodesic really probes only the boundary and it only sees the asymptotically ADS part, and hence it. I, I, 
I, I don't think this is, uh, may I just ask what is the motivation behind this question? Because beta is the impact parameter. Yes. And I believe that uh, this limit should be related uh, to the case of the critical impact parameter for the scattering in this uh, geometry. It's the type of uh, geodesics that we were studying with Massimo and so on. This is, uh, I were wondering whether uh, the, one, the, the situation gets simplified in this case. And you can make maybe, maybe give a more analytic result for the choice. I don't know if it's interesting from this point of view, but uh, I believe that the, it's something to think about. Okay. No, we, we haven't thought about this. I, I thought, um, so my naive int intuition was that this is the limit where the geodesic actually goes almost across the, the boundary where it's this asymptotically ADS region. So it captures little information about this. Uh, but I assume that it would be very much more under control than, than what we have. I, I don't... Uh, you see, beta is the ratio between the aggregate momentum and the energy. Yes. But the one is not, uh, I mean, it's something non-trivial. I mean, it's the standard. Yeah, yeah. You are saying just uh, the, the aggregate momentum is of the same order of the energy. I, mm. I would not expect some trivial situation in this case. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that's good. We haven't thought about this, but it would be certainly as inter interesting to see if uh, things simplify, I think. Okay. Thank you. So given that this formula is perturbative, essentially, in uh, small b, um, and if a b equals zero, it gives you delta is zero, could you not just get this from some kind of geodesic deviation where that second term under the square root is simply the, the curvature or deflect, causing a slight deflection of the, of the null geodesics? And you may not need any of the much detail of the geometry to, to get this. Would that be slightly more local than? What that? are you doing? You're shooting, you're, so in ADS, you're shooting a geodesic across the yeah. ADS and they all go to the same point. Yeah. Now, if you put a little dimple in the bottom of the ADS to make it, make it a little bit more deep with, with like a superstratum, then there'll be a slightly, there'll be a deflection that's governed by B, which will be small for, for small B. And so I'm just guessing this is some kind of very elementary uh, geodesic deviation. Admitted it's null geodesics, and we talk about geodesic deviation for time-like geodesics, but still, it's it's the same kind of deal. Mm. You should be able to get this by a simple curvature expansion around the uh, of the superstratum. It's the Excellent. higher it's the higher values when b is non perturbative that would be kind of fun. So I, th I think this result, this particular result, okay, is is exact in these. So I don't think this was done. This was done by just studying the exact, uh, the exact ADS free. Um, oh, I see. So that is an exact result in B. It's not for small b. So this is not for small b. So this okay. this this here isn't. Um, I think, but that is just a specific uh, specific result for this simple geometry one zero zero. Uh, for uh, I think for one zero n where you have a much more detailed geometry. Um, getting the high order um, high order phase shifts is quite complicated already so perhaps something which is slightly more uh, along your light would be probably probably given giving us a, a same result oh. but it would be much more uh controlled perhaps yeah okay uh, big. um the, the only problem that i see is like i if i still see that if you have this deviation right you would still have to this is still Delta is still something which you can define on the boundary, right? So if even if you have like a deviation, you will have to uh, probably kind of integrate it along the geodesics to get something, and then you will have because and, and the geodesic. Well, the, the ones are in the pure single bed superstructure doesn't depend on any angles, so there's conserved momentum, and it will mm -hmm. just dive in and come out. Um, the only point being that if B gets too large, then you have to worry about what Demille was talking about yesterday, and you won't come out on an algae because the string gets excited, it becomes massive and doesn't even make it out. It, it gets trapped. Hmm. So, there's going to be some, so there's going to be some critical value of B that if you get too large, then you get stringy excitations. If B remains small, then you have some faith that the particle remains a particle and it doesn't get excited. Sorry, Emil, you were going to say something. Uh, no, just question. Clarification question. So is this for one, which, which uh, superstrata is this for? Or is this just for two charge? So this one, this exact expression that is currently on the screen, I think this is for two charge. So this is one zero zero. 
Oh, okay, Whereas, so there's no ADS2 region, so it's not no, nothing ever gets trapped. Not here, yeah, not oh, here. I see. Good. Okay. Um, so uh, for for higher order, so th this is kind of like the the goal that we're going into, right? So for one zero n, it's it's harder to get these kind of phase shifts, but it would be interesting to see whether you can use the CFT techniques once you once you have the first order. Can you use the CFT techniques to get further on? To see, like, mm -hmm. can you can you get this capture region for one zero n? Um, by just using some CFT techniques, which would be like consistency conditions, and then you import sort of a, like as a loop. Um, right. Just Any a other quick question? question. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Bolton. Yeah, uh, you talked about in the one zero n case about n one and n zero. Does it make sense to look at what happens if n goes to infinity? Uh, so, uh, So this would mean a very long throat, right? Um, Possibly. Is then the momentum wave close to the transition region at the top of the throat? Actually, what has to happen, if you take the n goes to infinity, I, I know what happens for superstar if the n goes to infinity. Then, do you have the bump function there, Nate? Can you just put the bump yeah, function? Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. So I just want to point out what happens, because I actually looked at this kind of fun. Look at that bump function. If you take the n goes to infinity limit, then what actually happens is that becomes an exponential. You have to send a, it becomes, a, it becomes an exponential of a, something like a squared over r squared or e to the minus x a squared over r squared. So you just do the standard exponential. And then it becomes some bizarre um, function where uh, it's no longer analytic and r is zero. So it's kind of like a BTZ black hole with, with some very peculiar non-analytic non dressing at r is zero because as I say, that bump function becomes uh, e to the minus a squared over r squared at the horizon. So there's some limit there, but it's it's a very bizarre limit. I actually looked at it, and it's you know, it, to make sense of it, it's n goes to infinity is odd. But to start with the bump mm -hmm. functions, you see weird mm -hmm. shit happening. I see. Uh, hi, uh, Vasco here from Kyle I have a very quick question um, about the, you mentioned uh, that uh, you analytically continued k to non-integer values, and yep. you have an interpretation of this as an ensemble of, of geometries. Can you can you explain this a little bit further or if anything like that can be done in the uh, one zero and super -sato? So I think the idea is that the, first of all, this comes from, from kind of two points of view. So the first point of view is that the conical defects that are allowed from, from string theory are those that, which have integer K. So, for from a geometric point of view, I don't think that if you have k which is real doesn't have like a an interpretation which would be a, an allowed geometric interpretation in terms of a metric. Mm -hmm. um, on the CFD side, this would correspond to I think um, just you you put these uh, states away, so we would have just plus plus k and then n, which would be n over n over k would be. Uh, um, but these kind of states also are kind of integers, right? So they're also just integer states. So then if you, if you would have something which is a non-integer state, you would have some, you would have just a, um, you would have to have an ensemble whose average would be a real value. Mm -hmm. So by just studying pure states, I don't think you would be able to get something which is a, uh, which is a non-integer K, which would be concentrated around a non-integer K. But if you consider an ensemble of states, you can get like this non-integer case. So that, that's kind of like, I think that is the, the, the way to look at it. Um, you would still be able to get like a heavy state, but then just, uh, just uh, again, this is all in the, um, uh, this notation is from the uh, free orbifold point. But I, I think that is the main interpretation that you wouldn't be able to construct a pure state, which would have the same charges as you have in the, in the uh, okay, but but in a in a way you would be able to still analytically continue your scattering results, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Picture, so, right. So so do they do they qualitatively differ from your scattering results at, at integer? Uh, no, so? no. So that that is one of the things, right? So perhaps our our hope was that you would see something that at integer k you would get something which is right. different from non-integer k. 
yeah but at the moment it, it doesn't seem like it it doesn't seem like so you would um so i think the idea was that if you have non-nature decay you could do things which are uh which are done in all of these analyses which just assume that you have a generic um einstein gravity dual and you just have one thing but it turns out that there i think as far as i know that there is no no difference between integer k and non-integer k okay okay thanks Any further questions or comments or issues? So if you did this with Superstrata, I mean, what sort of further information do you think you would get out about the CFT from this? Um, so on one hand, it might help us to get new information about just what, what's in the CFT that we're working with, right? On the supergravity point. Um, well, you were extracting anomalous dimensions and things like that. Yeah. So, um, but but if you go, superstrata is really just, is a state of the CFT. So will you see something new about those anomalous dimensions, or will you see something different? Um, I, I I guess the the idea is that you calculate the stuff that actually hasn't been calculated before, right? So so far we've just performed checks just to see well this is consistent. Can we use this further on? And now, now I think now the heavy lifting is uh, what's going to. Okay, but there are many calculations in superstrata you could do, but but some of the, a lot of them won't teach you anything. I'm just trying to ask the question: What's the best thing you could perhaps learn from doing this in the superstrata? What what would you want to do? Why would you want to do the calculation? Not because well, because it's there is the good enough exact good enough answer. Um, I, I think the the main main goal would be uh can i somehow use this kinematic regime to first of all get a difference between what a pure state is and what a black hole looks like um can i find can i find a difference so that would be mm -hmm. what the specific calculation is um is uh i Uh, yeah, I don't know. Perhaps uh, so. Yeah, my the, I think the ultimate goal is: can we use the CFT limit? Can we use this particular limit to see the differences between a generic ensemble state and a pure state? Yeah. I guess. Ultimate. It's, it's just, you know, uh, the question is, is it this limit or is it the process that MLI we're looking at with tidal forces acting on strings that gives you the transition from, you know, to, to black holes and trapping? Or is it, so, you, I, I'm trying to see whether there's something else I would learn from here because Emeralds and I, my calculations suggest that at some point if B gets large enough, then the thing just ain't coming back. And here, you get so, so there might be some interesting. Wait, doesn't that depend on the initial energies that you shoot the thing in? With? No, no, Emil's made that point no. yesterday. It's 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 the point is the amount of excitation is proportional to the energy you throw in. So the return oh, yes. height is universally independent of the energy. What matters is the depth of the throat, and half roughly speaking, halfway down the throat is when you start exciting the string. So if you stay a little bit above that then it, the thing will come back and probably come back as a photon. So then, then, then you're oh, sorry, on an algaedesic. So then this would be, you know, you might study in perhaps the transition to the black hole like behavior where you're getting very, very close to exciting the string mode and turning it massive, but, but not quite. And I don't know, maybe that's the, that's the pro. You make the thing just deep enough to, to, to start really beginning to Ex not quite excite the string modes, but still have a hell of a lot of curvature or you know, tidal force, I should say. I mean, in a sense, this kind of calculation might predict its own downfall, right? So this might. Well, uh, no, but I, I think you might get, you know, how to put it, it's always, you know, if you, if you make the B big enough, then you get the, Emerald, which I've shown that you sort of get the black hole like behavior, the damn thing gets trapped. And doesn't come back until you know it thermalizes, and then finally maybe tunnels out eventually. But but, but if that, you but if you're very shallow, it comes out as just a particle. And somewhere as you approach that limit, maybe there's something cool you'll find. So, Emil, you were going to say something? Oh, just that that uh, 
that intuition again crucially will relies on turning on little n um turning on little n so, sorry may, may i say something to this point so uh, I, I mean the, the question of the tidal forces um, it's very nice physics but it's stringent physics right yeah. so in some sense uh, uh, even if I like it very much, right? One could ask, what if I put alpha prime equals zero, right? If I put alpha oh. prime equals zero, so I, I work really in the very strongly coupled regime of the CFT, one may ask whether there is an information problem there, right? Uh, right? Okay. Cool. And uh, and then okay, if alpha prime is equal zero, then then there is no tidal excitation, and then one may ask whether the picture that Nate had that all the geodesics fall into the BTZ, right, is preserved or not by the one zero N uh, microstate, right? And I think the, the, the um, result that we have, preliminary result is actually that the microstates uh, behave quite differently from the BTZ. So for the, for the microstate, you actually have in the supergravity approximation, always geodesics that turn back. So there is a turning point. So, since the, the, I mean, maybe trying to answer the question, I mean, one of the motivation, right, is maybe this type of calculation shows that there is a qualitative difference between microstate and, and black hole. And then it's something that you can see by solving a simpler problem than the correlation, correlator, four point correlator, which is very difficult, as Nate was saying. And the simpler problem is just to, to study some geodesics. And then you have a direct relation between the geodesic problem and quantity of the CFT as, as, as the group in that can explain to us. Right. So uh, uh, in the supergravity case, I mean, microstates seem to be very different to black hole, even if they are in the black hole regime. Okay, so, I so uh, go ahead. No, I just want to say that our uh, computations for the geodesics precisely confirm the picture that uh, Rodolfo is saying. Uh, when you have a, a, a fastball, Typically, what happens is that the geodesics always escape uh, from the from the fastball. They can have a very large time delay, but they always escape. Yeah, but that's like the, the, you know, there was a calculation we did about eighteen months ago where we looked at Green's functions and we pinged it, and there was an echo at n one n five. I guess I'm uh, I guess I'm trying to reconcile that with the sort of new perspective that really that scalar that you're using as a probe is really a string on the T four and. And, and therefore it's going to get, that probe is going to get excited and not come back. Isn't this result kind of uh, contained in your calculation, Nick? Um, that's why I was wondering as we were going to some, you, you mean in the sense of the, the Green's function calculation? Yeah, I mean, you should be able to process the Green's function into a time shift. Yeah, exactly. Um, should be something like this. Admittedly, you know, we, we did the Green's function calculation by doing a whole bunch of approximation schemes, you know, with WKB and all this sort of stuff. But it was it was still. But this is the, this yeah. is that limit, right? You're just I mean, the yep. WKB limit. No, indeed. Ending like, around a particular geodesic. Exactly. So there should be a way to tie this directly back to the to the Green function calculation. Yeah. I mean, maybe after some sort of Fourier transform to go from. Uh, um, um, yeah, in fact, there's a Vermani translated into a. There's an earlier paper, I think, by Vermani, where he looks at these highly orbifolded pure ADSs, and where, and I think then there you can calculate Vermani. There's several other authors, but Vermani was one of them, um, where they calculate the Green's function. I think exactly in the highly orbifolded um, ADS. So that's the thing where you might just do the comparison directly. Hmm. Interesting. Any other questions or comments? Um, let's see. So Massimo just sent me an email saying I have to leave for half an hour. Or so, uh, so reconnect fifteen thirty. Um, so we've got Massimo's fifteen saying he's maybe a little bit late. Let me just see. We're ahead of schedule. 
Um, so we will pick up Massimo's talk at uh, 15.45 as the schedule is, because that's Massimo's got to do something right now. Um, so let's break off now. Do you want to stop the recording, Joseph, and we'll just talk as, as we feel? Let's thank the speaker again. Yes, thank you indeed. Sorry. <laughs>